know what? I quite firmly believe you should never actually tune the banjo because you always run the risk that not every member of the audience will leave as soon as they see it. But you know what else you should never actually tune? An aeroplane. I mean, sure, it would be so much fun if when you had two or three aeroplanes flying over you in the sky, their humming harmonised together into some sort of whimsical chord to lift your day slightly, but no one actually needs that. Or so I thought. Until I was researching the Strobicon, the first ever electronic chromatic tuner, which featured in my video on piano tuning, and came across this pamphlet from the 1956 Music Industry Trade Show in New York City. And just under this photo of zany Harpo Marx was an advert proudly declaring, the Strobicon has invaded the aircraft industry. They had genuinely begun selling this electronic chromatic tuner, which is what it was made to be and how it was marketed, to the aircraft industry and I do not understand why. To figure it out, we're gonna to have to take a few steps back and look at the company which made this device and what it actually did. So let's begin with a name that might be familiar to you. Aura Railsback. He's best known today for the Railsback Curve, a graph illustrating how pianos are deliberately stretch tuned, where the bottom is tuned deliberately flat and the top is tuned sharp. If you want to know more about that, I've done a whole video on it. But years before Railsback's eponymous curve was even a doodle on a napkin, he was a physics teacher at the Eastern Illinois University. While he was there, he was combining his physical prowess with his interest in music and finishing off his PhD in the physics of music. And it was that combined area of interest that within a few years would lead him through a door in a musical instrument factory, which had recently been painted with the words research laboratory. The musical instrument factory was owned by a company called CG Con Limited, and in 1928 when their research lab opened, it genuinely was one of the only laboratories of its kind, a dedicated research lab exploring new ways to build musical instruments, new mechanisms to make them play better, and new tools to assist musicians in their endeavours. And a whole swathe of patents came out of this laboratory, a lot of them to do with mechanisms for musical instruments, but some of them to do with electronic solutions for examining pitch. And it was building on this electronic analysis of pitch that Railsback filed his own patent, under the really quite boring name pitch determining apparatus. And what this device could do was it allowed you to preset a pitch that you wanted to tune to. You could then play a note into the device and it would tell you how much flatter or sharper you were than the note you were aiming for. This might have seemed pretty magical at the time, but the device was really quite simple. It only really had two major components, a spinning disc and a flashing light bulb. To understand how it works, let's start with something familiar a metronome. And the arm on this metronome is set to complete one full oscillation every second. And that's fairly easy to see looking at it. But what happens if we switch the lights off and flash them on once every second? And we know the arm is still moving, but because the light is flashing at the exact same point in the oscillation every time, it's giving the impression that the arm is staying still. And this is a very basic stroboscope effect. Let's swap the metronome for Railsback's spinning disc. Now in this device, the rotational speed of the disc represents a known frequency. It's the note that you're trying to tune to. So if you're trying to tune an A, for example, you'd set the disc spinning at 27.5 revolutions per second. Now 27.5 hertz is the lowest A on your piano keyboard, but because of the pattern on the disc where it's split into four segments, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64, those divisions are allow you to tune any octave you like. The input into the device was through a microphone which was attached to the flashing light bulb. It was set up in such a way that when you played a note into the microphone, the light bulb would flash at the frequency of that note. So for example, if you played a concert A at 440 hertz, the light bulb would flash 440 times per second. So if we bring those two elements together, you have the disc spinning at 27.5 hertz and you flash the light 440 times per second. You can see that the pattern on one of the outer rings of the disc appears static, and that is the octave that represents our middle A. So that's how it looks when you're playing in tune. What happens if you're playing slightly flat, if the frequency of the note you're playing goes down slightly? Well, the light bulb starts flashing slightly slower, which means that the disc appears to be drifting anti-clockwise. And similarly, if you're playing slightly sharp, the light bulb begins to flash slightly faster, which means the pattern on the disc appears to drift clockwise. So the aim of using this device was to tune your instrument in such a way that it made the pattern on the disc appear to stand still. And that's how you know that the frequency of the light bulb, the number of times per second it's flashing, matches the revolutions per second of the disc, or a doubling thereof. So this device gave the ability to tune a musical instrument to within a fraction of a cent of accuracy. And that's why you still sometimes see strobe tuners today. 
because they can show a level of accuracy that the guitar tuner you pick up in your local music shop just can't match. Not long after Railsback's patent was filed for the basic mechanism of the device, a second patent was filed by Alan Loomis, the chief research engineer at Con, and Robert Young, and this patent was specifically on behalf of CG Con Limited. This second patent was for an applied version of Railsback's original mechanism that upped the number of discs from 1 to 12, one for each note of the chromatic scale. The rotational speed of each of these discs were preset out of the box, so you didn't have to manually set the frequency like in Railsback's original, but it was ready to go to tune any note of the chromatic scale and it could do it at any octave because of the pattern on the discs. On the patent the device was named a stroboscope but soon hit the commercial market under the name Strobocon. Around the time that the patents for the Strobocon were being filed and approved the US government suddenly noticed there was this big war thing going on in Europe and they pressed the CG Con company and all their factories into military service. Now, getting involved in the war fitted Con's brand much more than you might think. The apocryphal story of how the company started, in fact, is that the founder, Charles Gerard Con, was out playing the cornet when he got punched in the face by a man on a horse. Look, here's that story in the Indianapolis News, just across the page from this advert for the health of a manly man. The story goes that Con got a busted lip in the fight, which made playing the cornet incredibly painful, which led him to invent a rubber-tipped cornet mouthpiece. And this led him to found a musical instrument company in his own name. Now you might think that Con isn't the best name for a company to instill consumer confidence, but it was great for a pun. They gave the instruments they built bold names such as the Constellation, the Conqueror, the Conquest, the Victor. Somebody ran out of puns for a little while. Which meant that when the US government asked them to get a bit more literal about the conquerors they were creating, they were more than happy to push the angst up to 11. They paused production of the magazine they used to put out, which had the slightly brainwashy title of Musical Truth, and replaced it with Americon, which boldly declared that victory is our business. Con is now 100% engaged in war production. This was accompanied by a wild infographic, which among other things showed how the keys from eight Con clarinets could be repurposed into three gas masks, two field howitzers, and an anti-aircraft gun in a pear tree. The advertising at this time also pivoted entirely to war messaging, with an ad in a 1943 edition of the Music Educator's Journal declaring, when Adolf hears that Americans are coming over with con instruments, he had better take to his dugout, because when these con instruments are functioning, they're going to help play tunes that the Axis won't like. Haha, <laughs> nice one. My cat is getting very confused about why I'm shouting. The upshot of all this is that during this period, CG Con Limited managed to make some connections in the aviation industry. And the fact that it had this research lab meant that its engineering capabilities were probably above and beyond what was expected from a musical instrument factory. He's demanding so much attention today, it's ridiculous. So we know that Con had links to the aviation industry. But why was the Strobicon useful to them? Let's recap what the Strobicon does. It listens to the frequency of a musical note played into the device, compares it to a known frequency, and tells you how in tune or out of tune it is. Except no, that was just the original use case for it. If we get much more literal about it, it's comparing one unknown frequency, the number of times per second the light bulb flashes, to a known frequency, the number of times per second the disc is spinning. So if you take the microphone out of the equation, and wire up the device in such a way that the light bulb flashes every time literally whatever you want happens, you can measure the frequency of anything. And that's why a delve into aeronautics research from the middle of the 20th century will see the name Strobicon pop up a surprising number of times, notably in research which came out of the NACA, which was the precursor to what we now call NASA. And you can find the Strobicon being used in these papers in a range of different ways, from measuring propeller speeds to measuring how fast a 45 degree delta wing was vibrating. There was even an experiment where they miniaturized a Bell X1E aircraft and attached it to a modified Strobicon to see how often it could handle rolling while traveling at supersonic speeds. I might go into more detail about one or two of these experiments in future videos, but what really struck me here was that this demonstrates a really vital part of innovation, which is taking a device or an idea or a principle from one area and bringing it into another. It's that cross-pollination of creativity and insight across different disciplines that creates the most unexpected solutions to the most interesting problems. The Strobicon was an incredibly important device at its peak. 
but it didn't take too many years before competitors started edging it out of the market from all sides. In 1967, Peterson developed their solid-state strobe tuner, which massively reduced the number of moving parts and the amount of calibration and maintenance the device needed. If you wanted a strobe tuner today, they're really the company to go to. They still make larger units similar to the Strobicon, but they also make small digital strobe tuners, which have the same level of accuracy and precision, but in a little stomp box or a little clip-on tuner. They still quite rightly make the case that the accuracy and precision of a strobe tuner just cannot be matched by the needle tuners that you might be more familiar with today. Speaking of which, Analog needle tuners were also arriving on the market at this time, and they were a lot smaller and a lot cheaper than their strobe tuner rivals. And while they couldn't match the accuracy of a strobe tuner, they were accurate enough for most use cases. And while the Strobicon was being pushed out of the music market, the aircraft industry was also developing smaller handheld stroboscopes that had much clearer and brighter displays than the Strobicon. All of which means, by the mid-1970s, Con had ceased production of the Strobicon. But the Con name still lives on, it's gone through a number of acquisitions in recent decades, and now finds itself under the umbrella of Steinway, who are best known for making fancy pianos. h and Selma, a French musical instrument manufacturer, which has also ended up under the Steinway umbrella, has been merged with Con to form Con Selma. And if you felt so inclined, a quick browse through the Con Selma website would still allow you to get your hands on a Constellation French horn. And that, my friends, is where we conclude. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do comment, like, subscribe, all the usual, and please consider buying me a coffee as well. That'll help these videos come out more often, and I'll see you in the next one.